Hello, I'm Simon Whistler, you're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today we're looking at the top 10 horrifying facts about the Roman legions. Number 10. Their military training Around Rome's beginning, its army was only comprised of local farmers who would be hurriedly called into action, fighting skirmishes with neighboring settlements. All of this would change, however, in 390 BC when an army of Gauls utterly defeated the Romans and then descended upon the city itself. They continued on, sacking and pillaging Rome for the next six months until finally they were paid off to leave. The Romans got a wake-up call, which would change their destiny forever. They spent the next following centuries perfecting their legions by systematically training and organizing a professional military machine like nobody had seen before. There were endless drills and marches to the point of exhaustion. Roman soldiers were attending weapons training every morning and practiced melee combat with wooden swords, spears, and shields twice as heavy as their real counterparts. Part of their daily training also involved a 19-mile-long march to be completed in five hours while carrying a full pack of weapons, shield, food rations, cooking supplies, and a short spade, along with their own personal kit. No other army in the world at the time would receive such a rigorous training, which gave the Roman legions a tremendous advantage in waging war. Number 9. Discipline Through Fear Following orders to the letter and not questioning one's superiors is something which most don't naturally have built into their consciousness. Severe punishments for even the slightest of offenses was something common within any Roman legion. Soldiers would oftentimes be stoned to death by their comrades for cowardice in battle or even for falling asleep at their posts while on sentry duty. Minor offenses were handled by the centurions, military officers, who always carried vine branches in order to strike at their legionaries. And since these officers were held directly responsible for the behavior of the men serving under them, whippings were commonplace in a Roman military camp. This ruthless treatment nevertheless proved useful time and time again, as the men became more reliant and trusting of each other for their very survival in the extremely harsh conditions they endured at the fringes of the empire. In short, this discipline instilled through fear gave Roman soldiers a far better chance of survival if they blindly obeyed their superiors than if they did not. Number 8. The Decimation one particularly brutal punishment for any legion was the decimation, and it was as bad as it sounds. The word itself comes from this Roman military disciplinary measure used on large groups of soldiers guilty of capital offenses like mutiny, treason, or desertion. Decimation is derived from the Latin term meaning removal of a tenth. The way they went about it was to have the guilty men divided into groups of ten, and to have them draw straws. The soldier who drew the short straw was to be killed by the other nine by clubbing him to death. And since the decision of who will die was left to chance, all soldiers were liable for execution, regardless of their level of involvement, rank, or distinction. But because killing off 10% of the army is almost never a good idea, the decimation never really became commonplace. Number 7. Weapons and Armor As Rome expanded its borders, the army became more standardized, with the equipment being provided by the state. Their first line of defense was the chainmail shirt. The main advantages of the chainmail were its light weight and that it offered good protection against slashing swords. During the 1st century AD, however, the chainmail was partially replaced by segmented plate armor. Though heavier and with a higher maintenance, plate armor offered a great deal more protection against piercing attacks. The Roman helmet was redesigned and improved over the centuries. It was fashioned in such a way as to offer maximum protection, but without blocking the senses. It had large cheek pieces as to protect the side of the face, but not to cover the ears, so the soldiers could hear the commands given by the centurions. The crests, oftentimes made out of horsehair or sometimes feathers, had the purpose of making the wearer appear larger and fiercer, as well as to distinguish between the ranks. Further protection came from the Roman shield. It was made of layers of wood glued together and covered with leather and metal. The shield was also curved, thus offering more protection to the sides. Due to its size, the shield was also used as an offensive weapon and worked perfectly in combination with the Roman short sword. Number 6. Battle Tactics and Formations But what truly made the Roman legions the best fighting force in the ancient world was the structured nature of the army and the formations they used in battle. A legion was comprised of 4,800 men, divided into 10 cohorts of 480, which in turn contained six centuries of 80 soldiers, each commanded by a centurion. The highly structured form offered the army both unity among the ranks as well as a great deal of coordination on the battlefield. Most of the barbarians the Romans were in conflict with fought in loose arrangements, and each warrior sought individual glory. But every one of the 4,800 soldiers in a Roman legion had a precise role to play in a master strategy. A typical assault would begin at long range, using catapults which shower the enemy with boulders and iron bolts. 
Next, the legionaries would launch their javelins, made of a wooden handle and a long iron head. The pilum, as it was called by the Romans, would bend on impact, preventing the enemy from throwing it back. Then the soldiers would stand shoulder to shoulder, swords out, and begin their advance as a moving wall of death and destruction. With the shield extending from their chins almost down to their ankles, there wasn't much a group of disorganized tribesmen could do. Number 5. Sea Battles Fought on Land A shortage of skilled Roman soldiers came in the form of sea warfare. As Rome took control of most of the Italian peninsula, they turned their attention out to sea. Here, they met the Carthaginians, and in 264 BC, the First Punic War had begun. This 23-year-long conflict between the two Mediterranean superpowers was fought over control of the strategically important islands of Sicily and Corsica. While Carthage boasted a sizable military fleet, Rome did not. Nevertheless, the Romans quickly countered that disadvantage by building their own navy following a design stolen from the Carthaginians themselves. Still lacking any real seafaring experience and while waiting for the ships to be built, the legionaries began practicing rowing in unison while still on dry land. Since they were expert melee fighters, they came up with an ingenious invention to turn sea battles into land battles. This secret weapon came in the form of the Corvus, a boarding bridge 4 feet wide and 36 feet long, which could be raised or lowered at will. It had small railings on both sides and a metal prong on its backside which would pierce the deck of the Carthaginian ship and secure it in place. With it, the Romans were able to defeat their enemy and win the war. Number 4. Bellum Gallicum the Gallic Wars, or Bellum Gallicum, were a series of military campaigns waged by the Roman legions under Julius Caesar against the Gauls living in present-day France, Belgium, and parts of Switzerland. These wars lasted from 58 BC to 52 BC and culminated with a definite Roman victory and expansion of the Roman Republic over the whole of Gaul. But these wars weren't waged for the glory of Rome per se, but rather for the political ambitions of Caesar himself. He recruited and paid his own legions, which made the soldiers highly devoted to him and him alone. Even though the region was home to somewhere around 15 to 20 million people, his successes were in large part due to the fact that the Gauls were a conglomeration of loose tribal armies that lacked any real discipline and cohesion. This way, Caesar had to fight each band of warriors as he encountered them, and the campaign stretched on for much longer than he initially anticipated. Vercingetorix, victory of a hundred battles, managed to finally rally the tribes against the Roman legions, but it was too little too late. At the Battle of Alesia in 52 BC, Vercingetorix almost prevailed against Caesar, but ultimately lost the battle. By the time the Roman conquest of Gaul had ended, over one million Celts lay dead, and another 500,000 were sent into slavery. Number 3. Crucifixions the Romans were notorious for the ways in which they treated and disposed of anyone who would stand in their way against total domination. One particular way they dealt with the people they thought threatened the Roman way of life was by crucifixion. This particularly brutal form of punishment was often used as a means of torture as well as to send a message. Those people who were crucified were oftentimes accused of sedition or conspiracy to rebellion. Jesus was crucified for the exact same reason and not for his religious teachings. The two men besides him were also considered insurgents, not thieves. Though not the inventors of this horrific practice, the Romans did excel in it. During Spartacus's rebellion in 72 BC, 6,000 captured rebels were crucified. Since Rome's population was about 40% slaves, and Spartacus and the other rebels were slaves themselves, their crucifixion was a definite message to those still living. Do not stir dissent, or this will be your end too. Number 2. The Praetorian Guard the most powerful of all Roman legions was the Praetorian Guard, which were stationed in Rome itself. And oftentimes, the Praetorians had the power of life and death over the emperors themselves. They came into being as elite soldiers protecting generals during the Roman Republic. But the Praetorian Guard in itself didn't officially appear until Augustus became Rome's first emperor in 27 BC. They acted as bodyguards to the emperor, emergency firefighters, the secret police, crowd control, and even fought in the arena to show off their prowess to the masses. But as Rome's power grew, so did its corruption and intrigue, and the Praetorian Guard was at oftentimes right in the middle of it all. Even though their task was to ensure the interests of the emperor, if those interests didn't coincide with their own, they would just replace him. Disgruntled Praetorians famously engineered the assassination of Caligula in 41 AD. Many other emperors were also killed by the Praetorians. In 193 AD, they even put the crown up for auction. One man, Julianus, won by promising them each a bribe of five years' pay, but since he couldn't deliver, he too was murdered 66 days later. In 306 AD, the Praetorians tried to play the role of kingmaker one last time by supporting Maxentius as the Western Emperor in Rome. They were defeated by Constantine at the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312, and he then disbanded the guard. 
Number 1. Making and Breaking the Empire Without a doubt, the Roman Empire, in all its might, was made by the many legions who fought and killed for it. But in the end, the army is what brought Rome down. As we've seen up until now, Rome was a highly militarized society with an army of about 130,000 soldiers. One man in eight was in the army, and while in the beginning only men with property were allowed to fight for the glory of Rome, once it expanded beyond the Italian peninsula, the ranks were open to a great deal more people. Foreigners were employed as auxiliaries, and after 25 years of fighting, they would be granted citizenship. Since these men were not citizens of Rome, they didn't believe in the idea of Rome and the civilization it brought with it, most never even seeing the city itself. Now many soldiers had less interest in defending it and instead making their fortune through the spoils of war. Their loyalty was no longer to the city or empire, but to the generals who they were serving under, like was the case with Caesar and his legions. Army generals then realized they could become emperor just by marching into Rome, which they often did. By 395 AD, the empire would be divided into the east and west, and by 476, only its eastern part would survive. The Eastern Roman Empire would rule from Constantinople and be a dominant force in the region for the following 1,200 years. So I really hope you found that video interesting and suitably horrifying. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. There's a button on the screen below me now as well as below the video. Also, if you like this video, why not check out some of our other videos which are over there on the right. And thank you for watching.